Hello everyone, nice that you're here again. Welcome to a new video. Today I'm gonna talk about constraint satisfaction due to the yeah the last feedback you gave me that you wanna know more about genetic algorithms and how I can handle constraints. If you didn't see the video, just click over here and watch it. And yeah, enjoy watching. If you like the video, um, give me a like and subscribe here. So have fun. Topic today, like I already said, um, is constraint satisfaction. And I'm gonna cover this theme only for genetic algorithms. My example today will be NSGA2, um, but you can also apply it to all other videos um, if you like. Yeah. So first of all, I prepared a little example for you guys. So here you can see um, an animation for an unconstrained NSGA2 problem um, applied to optimize F1 and F2. In our case, we want to minimize both of these. So on one side, F1 is the sum of all negatives of the squared xi in the array x. So from our case, I kept x small, so we only have x1 and x2. But um, yeah, for other examples, x could be much longer. And F2 on the other side is quite similar, but instead of squaring xi with um, and then taking the negative, we first subtract xi to two, square it, and then take the negative and take the sum of all of them. So what I also have is, like always, I have borders for x1 and x2. To keep it simple, my borders were chosen between zero and two for x1 and x2. Now to see the difference uh, to a constraint problem, I animated on the left side, the unconstrained NSGA2 search. And on the right side, um, I added a constraint to the described problem. Um, so my constraint here was that the sum of x1 and x2 needs to be smaller or equal than two. As you can see, the constraint problem has a similar result to the minima of F2. But if you take a closer look um, to the x-axis, so looking at F1, um, most of the points on the constraint problems lie between minus one or yeah, minus one and minus four. There are only some points coming better, like minus five, minus six, but they disappear again. So they are not in the Pareto frontier. And this is related to the constraint. And um, yeah, after 20 generations, the NSGA2 gives a Pareto frontier also for the constraint problem, um, which looks like this. So here you can see clearly that in the Pareto frontier, the best solutions for F1 are more or less um, three, minus 3.5. And not like the unconstrained problem, like you can see in the animation um, about um, minus eight in the best case. So let's go more into detail a bit why this happens and uh, to see how we can handle these constraints in our NSGA2. Imagine we have uh, two other target functions here, F1 and uh, F2. And um, besides these functions, our X1 and our X2 has also different boundar uh, boundaries. And um, if I would just run my NSGA2 unconstrained, my Pareto frontier would look like this approximately. What happens now is if I had constraints, some parts of my unconstrained area where I can search solutions for um, disappear. So as an example, if I add my first constraint, C1, the whole target space above this, uh, above this red line you can see won't be available anymore. So there are no solutions in this space anymore because the constraints don't allow it so far. Adding another constraint now, C2 in this example, you see that everything on the left side of C2 will disappear as well. So it's not in my search space anymore as well because X1 and X2 don't allow these constraints or don't allow to search there anymore. And what happens is that I have a new search space I call it a constraint search space um, and I only can search in this space and therefore my Pareto front here is here shown and also with some example points where they would lay um, is on the purple line and on part of the green line 
um, as well. So due to constraints, the Pareto frontier of the problem changes. So to implement this in our existing NSGA, we first have to give every individual in our search a new attribute. I call it the constraint count. Perhaps you remember it from my last video, every individual has different attributes like DNA. So in our case for the problems, these would be X1 and X2, so the X array, the performance, which would be the values for F1 and F2, um, and so on. And for every constraint the individual doesn't satisfy, the constraint count will be increased by one. Means the higher the constraint count, the more constraints are not satisfied. For an, as an example, I did a, I have here a code snippet I did on myself, um, on my own, and um, I have a constraint function called cons1. Um, it returns true when the sum of all inputs, also called DNA in this case, is smaller or equal than two. So I refer to the first problem we talked about. Otherwise, false is returned. Um, what I do here is I save all constraints in a list. And um, then I have, for every individual, I check how many constraints are satisfied and how many aren't. So basically for one individual, you can see here, I iterate through the list of constraints. In this case, there's only one constraint in this list. Yeah, But then I look, if this constraint does not satisfy, or if every constraint in the list does not satisfy the constraint, um, the individual does not satisfy the constraint, sorry. And every time this is the case, I add to my constraint count one. Means the more constraints are not satisfied, the higher my constraint count. So as an example here, the DNA of the individual is one and two. If I add up one and two, this equals three. If I ask my cons one function if three is smaller or equal than two, it returns false and therefore the constraint count is one and not zero anymore. But to find all Pareto optimal solutions now, um, we always check which individuals aren't dominated by others by comparing the performance of the different target indicators with each other. This is the normal process of, of NSGA2. Uh, this function was already explained in the last video. So if I have two individuals, I look at the performance of the target indicators and I'm looking if one or both are better or equal. And if this is the case, I return a true. Otherwise, it's dominated by the other individual. And um, constraint satisfaction is easily integrated by just wrapping this domination check into another check where this first check with um, both individuals, um, if one individual satisfies more constraints than the other one. So it means if one individual, for example, this here individual one is violating less constraints, it is dominating individual two, even if the performance of individual two is better than the performance of individual one. So if we have a rank, the constraint satisfaction is here. And only if the constraint satisfaction is equal, like you can see in the next line, or is zero for both, then it is checked which one is, has a better performance. So first, constraint satisfaction counter is, is compared, and then the performance is compared. So, and this is the normal part of NSGA2, which is marked in red. So only if the violation counter of both is zero, uh, it is checked which one is performing better. If individual one is performing better than two, it's a, a true is returned, so the domination is given as well, and otherwise a false is returned. And this needs to be integrated in normal NSGA2 as a wrapper around the normal dominates function, and you add to every individual the attribute of the violation count, and um, that's all you need to do, and the NSGA2 will find the new Pareto frontiers based on the in the constraint search area. Yeah. I hope you enjoyed the video. Um, I hope I could help you somehow as well. And I would be happy if you subscribe here. Let me know in the comments uh, what you want to know next about. And yeah, visit my channel for new stuff. Have a nice day. Bye.